one for you train lovers. Also this spot shows us how much earth they've banked up onto here because that goes right down there because I've had to leave the trees alone and obviously the railway bank. But yeah, it's certainly they've certainly raised it about four to five foot I would say. The lady in the office was quite nice and she said, well we've raised it to allow We've raised it to the illegal, to the legal requirement to allow for new burials in the future, so it's probably five to six foot. Yeah, we're leaving Sarah Chapman Deerham's grave site now. I wanted to show the trains as well because when you think 1888, when Annie Chapman died, the Second World War people who were buried in that one over there, over the other side of there. And when Sarah Deerham herself died, Deerman, sorry, herself died, it would have been steam trains chugging up and down that line. Uh, the world changes and things turn on as they go. Mm. Not always for the better either, in my opinion. But yeah, this has caused quite a lot of outrage. There was a big petition over it, which I assume is the only reason that the... <laughs> Sarah Dearman's grave will be the only one that will be marked now. I mean, if you look at the other common sections of the cemetery, which is the same as this, that this there was the same level as this. They are very bad. I mean, I could looking for a grave, I could look in there, which I had to go back to the office to be told that it's gone. I could barely move around in that and nearly fell into a foxhole, so it is bad. If this one is over the 35 minutes, I'll just have to be a YouTube jobby or I'll break it down into separate sections. It annoys me that I can't put a video longer than 35 minutes and so many seconds on Facebook now. It keeps muting me after so much of a time. We're going down Burge Drive. On our way we see the graves of many different people. And there are particular ones that I wish to point out to you. The first one coming up in a minute. See this one, look. The family grave of John and Jane Norwood, completely covered over, so this section will probably be the next one to be worked on. But over here, we've got a war grave, which is on a private family grave. So. Louis Alec Costa, Stoker First Class Royal Navy. The original stone, as you can see, is very much worn away now. It's got the navy emblem and the reef. But what's nice is that, although his original stone is gone, he's got his Commonwealth War Grave stone. So, L.A. Costa, we wouldn't have known otherwise for the original stone. That it's Louis Alec Costa, Stoker First Class Royal Navy. PV KX126952 HMS Pembroke the 4th 2nd of April 1946 aged 28 years So he's our first war hero and we do have others There is one that I spotted that I wish to show you It's further along this way So I'll have to keep an eye out It's on one of these old private family graves that's uh, tilted over to one side and that now, but I don't think I've walked past him. Just to hope. No, here he is. This one. It's on an old family grave, and they've both. The this isn't a family grave connected to these people, as far as I know. But they've both gone on to each other. But the man I want, and this, the inscription's gone from this one because it's completely blistered. But the man I wanted to focus on is in love. Is another veteran, in loving memory of Sergeant Charles William Mason, 11th Battalion Royal Fusiliers, killed in action at Polygon Wood, August the 10th, 1917, aged 23 years. Greater love hath no man than this that lay down his life for his friends. So yeah, it's another veteran. But it's in he's in a
private family grave, so you didn't have to have a Commonwealth War grave if you didn't want one. Some people didn't. Now we are going on to the war grave section. Main ones I wanted to cover, one of whom is waiting to receive a memorial. to our section now I want to take you to which looks a lot tidier I must say than the greater part of the cemetery so it's through here we have to go and over towards the back bit of it Bird Road so, if any of you wish to come and see Annie Chapman's memorial, Sarah Chapman Diamond's former grave site, or where she is buried underneath all that lot, hopefully they'll get a memorial sorted for her soon. I'm going to point you down because these are oh, quite recent, yeah. Late 90s to 2000s. Here we are, our section of war graves. So, if you're on Facebook, join me for part two. If you're on YouTube, carry on watching. If you're on TikTok or Instagram, we have them in 10 minute segments, so just watch out for the go to the next video thing. So, But before we move over to the next episode, which covers this actual Commonwealth War Grave section itself. Let's have a look back at the stories of two of the men whose graves we've visited in this part of the tour. Both veterans themselves, one buried in a private grave but has a Commonwealth War Grave stone, and the other also buried in a private grave but doesn't have a Commonwealth War Grave stone. I've been able to glean quite a bit on these two men, where they served and how they served, things like that. Particularly with Louis, what I really enjoyed with him, who will be our first man we look at, is although we can't pinpoint his, exactly who he is or where he is in this picture, there's a picture with dozens of sailors in it and listed amongst the names is L.A. Costa. So we know he's there somewhere, but as to quite where we don't know. Our second individual, we don't have any pictures of him himself but we do have pictures and information of the battle he served and died in. So, off we go and we'll look at the story of two of these brave men. Stoker First Class Louis Alec Costa Who is somewhere in this photograph? As we see on his Commonwealth War gravestone, it's marked HMS Pembroke 4. This is not a ship. HMS Pembroke 4 was a Royal Navy accounting base at Knorr between 1939 and 1961, and it is this base and Knorr that Louis is linked to. HMS Pembroke was the name given to a shore barracks at Chatham and Knorr. It was commissioned in 1878 moved ashore in 1903 and was paid off in 1983. The Nore is a long bank of sand and silt running along the south centre of the final narrowing of the Thames estuary, England. Its southwest is the very narrow Nore sand. The Nore has been the site of a Royal Navy anchorage since the age of sail, being adjacent to both the city and port of London and to the Medway. England's principal naval base and dockyard on the North Sea. In the Second World War, it oversaw naval operations in the North Sea along the east coast of Britain, guarding against invasion and protecting trade. And that's what Louis' war was. Engine room duties, one of the most dangerous, 
places to be, in wartime, in the ships, on which he served. Keeping our coast and country safe. A stoker was someone who specialized in engine room duties. The name was acquired from the days when ships were coal-fueled and stokers were those who shifted coal. Louis survived the war, only to take sick on board the elderly Royal Navy vessel HMS Plinlimon, a steam-powered paddle steamer, used as a minesweeper during World War II, in the spring of 1946. Being taken back to his base, on shore, and dying there shortly afterwards, on the 2nd of April, 1946, at the shore establishment of HMS Pembroke 4. And now for a look at Sergeant Charles William Mason. I've been able to find out quite a bit on him and his story, his life before the war and unfortunately in the war and his story, what happened to him, the battles he served in and died in. So on to that part now. And here we catch Charles William Mason on the 1901 census. I like this because it gives us a lot of detail about him and also lets us know his parents were, remember that the larger gravestone of the grave that he is in is completely blistered and worn away so that gravestone is very likely for his parents so here we go this is Charles in 1901 Charles W Mason Mal age 6 birth year 1895 he was born in 1894 so he's obviously not quite reached his seventh birthday yet census was taken on the 31st of March and Charles appears in the September quarter of the um, birth registrations thing, so September, October, November. So he's born between September and November 1894. Can work out from that. Hackney, birthplace, and they're living in Hackney in 1901. Um, event notice: Warburton Square, Hackney. So southwest Hackney. And here we get Charles's parents. So we've got David John Mason, aged 38. His birth year is approximately 1863. Um, birthplace Hackney as well. And he's a cabinet maker. That's a pretty decent profession to be in in those days. They would have been classed as working middle class in, in that regard, which is probably why Charles ended up as a sergeant and in slightly higher up circumstances in the regiment. His father is the head of the household, as we can see. He's also born in Hackney. Um, here we get Charles's mother, Phoebe Mason, aged 37 in 1901. Her approximate birth year is 1864. She's, of course, married and wife, and there's no occupation listed. They didn't tend to for women in those days because they thought it was common. And here we see Charles's older brother, Henry D. Mason, age 16, born in 1885, so nine years before Charles, he's 16 in 1901, and his occupation is a printer. But back to the main man who will feature in our video now, Charles W. Mason, and on to, unfortunately, the sadder part of the story, which was his war and his eventual death at Polygon Wood in 1917 so I'll talk you through or rather my uh, AI person will talk you through the battle and things that he was in off we go for that part now and now for a look at Sergeant Charles William Mason's war we know much more about him and the battle he lost his life in The capture of West Hook. The 10th of August, 1917, took place on the Gelleveld Plateau near Ypres, in Belgium, during the Third Battle of Ypres, the 31st of July to the 10th of November, 1917, in the First World War. 
the British 5th Army attacked the Gelevelt Plateau at the Battle of Pilkham Ridge, the 31st of July to the 2nd of August. But the German 4th Army had fortified its positions in the Ypres salient since the Second Battle of Ypres, the 22nd of April to the 25th of May, 1915. The British reached the first objective in the south and the second objective on the northern flank, losing some ground to German counterattacks. A British attack due on the 2nd of August was postponed because torrential rains from the afternoon of the 31st of July until the 5th of August washed out the battlefield. The ground had been churned by artillery fire into sloughs of mud, flooded shell craters, fallen trees, and barbed wire. After several postponements, the attack was set for the 10th of August. British artillery fired a preparatory bombardment from Polygon Wood to Langmark for the main attack due on the 14th of August, but the German guns concentrated on the Gelevelt Plateau. British counter-battery fire was hampered by low cloud and rain, which made air observation extremely difficult and shells were wasted on empty gun emplacements. Fresh divisions took over by the 4th of August, but the frontline troops had to be relieved every 48 hours, which exhausted all of the infantry by the 10th of August. The German 52nd Reserve Division, which had not been relieved after the 31st of July and the 54th Division, which had taken over on the northern flank of the plateau by the 4th of August, were also exhausted. The British attack on the right flank began well and some troops quickly reached their objectives. The 74th Brigade of the 25th Division on the left flank advanced fast and reached its objectives by 5.30 a.m. The Germans in West Hook were rushed, but on the right flank. Sniping and attacks by German aircraft caused an increasing number of British casualties. German artillery began an SOS barrage at 6 o'clock a.m. from Stirling Castle to West Hook. The foremost British infantry were cut off in the open and counterattacked. Around 7 p.m., fresh German infantry advanced behind a smokescreen and by nightfall, Inverness Copse, and most of Glencourse Wood, had been recaptured. The 25th Division held on around West Hook but lost 158 men killed, 1,033 wounded and more than 100 missing. The defeat of the 18th Eastern Division at Inverness Copse, Fitzclarence Farm and Glencourse Wood left German snipers and machine gunners free to fire into the right flank of the 25th Division. German counterattacks continued into the night but communication by SOS rockets, daylight lamps, carrier pigeons and runners enabled the British artillery accurately to bombard German troops as they assembled and it was at the action from Polygon Wood that Sergeant Charles William Mason lost his life sadly like so many others his body was never recovered and he is remembered on the Menin Gate near Ypres in Belgium amongst those who fell in battle and have no known grave And of course, he is remembered on the stone we've seen in Manor Park Cemetery. Now, on to the next part of our tour, the Commonwealth War Graves section. So, join me in the next video as we take a respectful tour of that section of the cemetery.